Shema Israel, Hear, O Israel. Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha. Love the Lord your God. Bekol levavcha, with all your heart. Uvecho nafshecha, with all your soul. Uvecho modecha, and with all your might. Ve'ahavta recha kamocha, and love your neighbor as yourself. Welcome to worship at Davidson College Presbyterian Church. You may find our bulletins at dcpc.org or on a link in the chat. Come and worship the Lord. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, 
Will you join me in our call to worship? Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God with thanksgiving and extol the Lord with music and song. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture, the flock under God's care. Let's continue our worship singing this beautiful old hymn, Come Christians Join to Sing.
when we don't know how or what to pray, the Spirit knows. When all we can muster are sighs and groan, the Spirit knows those also. When we feel that we aren't even worthy to approach God, the Spirit goes before us and with us, and God welcomes us with arms open. Therefore, let us confess our sins together, saying, Lord God, we have given more weight to our successes and our happiness than your will. We have eaten without a thought for the hungry. We have spoken without an effort to understand others. We have kept silence instead of telling the truth. We have judged others, forgetful that you alone are the judge. We have acted rather in accordance with our own opinions than according to your commands. Within your church, we have been slow to practice love for our neighbors, and in the world we have not been your faithful servants. Forgive us and help us to live as disciples of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Let us now pause for our own silent prayers. Friends, hear the good news. Scripture declares, Can a woman forget her nursing child or show no compassion for the child of her womb? As a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you, says the Lord. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Grace and peace and welcome to worship with Davidson College Presbyterian Church. This is the last Sunday in the season of Easter, and friends, it is the last of our pre-recorded services of worship. Starting next week on May 23rd, we are resuming in-person worship. May 23rd is Pentecost Sunday, the birth of the church. I'm calling it the rebirth of the church. We hope that you'll be here in person and that you'll wear red as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that not everybody is feeling ready to come back to worship. Not all of you can be at worship. Good news is we're live streaming every service, 8.30 from the chapel, 9.45 from here in the congregation house, 11 o'clock from the front steps of the sanctuary. And if we've live streamed, that means it's going to be at YouTube and Facebook, well, forever. And you can enjoy it throughout the week in preparation for following Sunday's worship. So whether you are live streaming in person or catching up later in the week, we hope that you'll continue to be a part of our worship life. Now, because we're on what 15 months of live streaming and pre-recorded services, you know the drill. In the chat and comment section, there's a friendship pad. Tell us you're here. Tell us how to pray for you. There's a link to online giving, and thank you for your faithful and generous giving. You are empowering life-changing ministries even now. There is also a link to the bulletin, so you can see all of the announcements. And today, there's also a link to an FAQ, a frequently asked question document about resuming in-person worship and other activities over the summer. So click those links, not while the preacher is preaching, and be up to date with everything that's going on in the life of our church. Speaking of everything going on in the life of our church, because it's Pentecost next week, there is, in fact, a Pentecost offering. And I invite you now to enjoy a minute for mission about what that offering does for our community and for the wider church. Hello, my name is Terry Bentley. And I'm Ethan Bentley. We serve on the Global Missions Committee at DCPC. We want to share with you briefly about the Pentecost offering, which will be received on May 23rd, Pentecost Sunday. The Pentecost offering is used to support ministries in our denomination with youth and young adults as well as children at risk. The offering helps support things like our Young Adult Volunteer Program, of which many of our Davidson College UKirk students have been a part of. It also supports the every three-year youth triennium at Purdue University where 5,000 teenagers gather for worship, learning and, insp and inspiration as they grow in faith. It supports ministries with children like DREAM, a program of education and support for African American children. Our congregation is allowed to designate a local use for 40% of the offering, and the Global Mission Committee this year has designated Children's Hope Alliance at Berrien Springs as a recipient. 
This organization provides support for over 2,000 children and youth throughout North Carolina who are in low-income families or unhealthy family situations. Psalm 71, 17 states, O oh God, from your youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. This passage testifies that a foundation of faith established during childhood helps ensure long life, faith, and service. The patterns and lessons established through these formative years continue to bear fruit throughout a person's life. By giving to the Pentecost offering, you are nurturing the faith of those who are the church and now in the church to come, children, youth, and young adults. Please give generously to the Pentecost offering. You may write Pentecost offering on a check that you can mail to the church or type Pentecost offering in the memo line when giving online. And you may also text Pentecost to 91999. Help us support and nurture the next generation through the Pentecost offering. Thank you. Thank you. Will you pray with me? Come Holy Spirit, enable us to do more than recognize words from a page. Help us to understand what it means to follow Jesus and trust in you. Amen. Good morning. You know, I have some friends up here at the front of the church, but I know there are some other younger worshipers out there. Will you come up and sit with me? I have a special message for you. Come and see, come and see. Well, it is good to see you today. Thank you for coming up. Today is, well, I just said it's good to see you, but the truth is I can't see you. I'm talking to a camera. I've been talking to cameras for over 15 months now. But the great news is that next week I get to see some of you right here in the congregation house where we're going to have our 945 service of worship. And I hope that next week you'll come up for our children's time. Now today... Today, I said, oh, by the way, for next week, it's not just coming back to the church for those who want to come back. It's also a special Sunday we call Pentecost. So when you come back to church next week, whether you're wearing school clothes or pajamas or whatever you're wearing, if you've got some red, wear red for Pentecost. It is the color of the Holy Spirit. And Pentecost is the day we celebrate the Spirit coming to the church and sending us out to love and to do God's work in the world. So wear red, whether it's pajamas or school clothes. Now, when I invited you up, I said I already had some friends up here. And here's what I was talking about. I want to introduce you to uh, some of the friends of the Henry children. This is Ruff Ruff, and Atticus took Ruff Ruff everywhere with him when he was younger. Little Ruff Ruff's missing an eye, but he's still just still soft and cuddly. I also have Dolphin. Dolphin was given to Haven by a very special friend. And Dolphin, I think, is going to go with Haven when she goes to college this fall and studies dolphins. And then I also have Dickalabotch. Dickalabotch is Whittier's friend. And you can see he's had a, a few cuts along the way, has the Detroit Tigers. Dickalabotch is a Tiger fan. And these are some of the friends in the Henry house. And why am I talking about their friends? Well, I know that some of you have had your friends with you for church this last year. When you've been in your living room or on your patio or up in your bedroom, sometimes even still in bed, you've had some of your friends with you. And I also know that coming back to church next week might be, well, for some people, they haven't seen so many adults in a long time and they haven't been in a big space like our congregation house. And maybe next week you want to bring some of your special friends with you when you're doing something new and big. These are the folks that kept the Henry children from feeling lonely or scared. And, well, maybe you want to bring your friends to worship next week. And if you do, will you please do me a favor? Will you make sure I get to meet your Ruff Ruff or your Dolphin or your Dickalabotch? I would like to know their names, too. Will you please join me in a prayer? We are grateful, O oh God, for your love and all the ways that we don't feel alone or scared. And sometimes that's through our special stuffed animal friends. 
for all of us as we begin to do new and different things. Help us to know that you're with us, whether we're at church, at home, at school, out on the playground, whatever it is, at camp. Help us to know that you are with us and that you are our most special friend. We say this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being with me today. Our first scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, John 17, verses 6 through 19. I've made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours and you gave them to me, and I've kept your word. Now they know everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and they know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf. I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may know my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, so that they may also be sanctified in the truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come! 
Today we are blessed to have as our preacher the Reverend Dr. Alice Rigel. Alice is the Associate General Presbyter for the Presbytery of Charlotte. That means she is one of the people who is a pastor to the pastors in the congregations who are part of our regional entity called the Presbytery of Charlotte. In addition to serving as the Associate General Presbyter, Alice has a long list of ways in which she has served local churches and the wider church. And she began to answer that call to ministry by earning her bachelor's degree at Presbyterian College and then her master's of divinity and her doctorate of ministry from Erskine Theological Seminary. It was following her time in seminary that she served as the pastor of Washington Street Presbyterian Church, also served as adjunct professor of pastoral care at Erskine Theological Seminary, as well as campus pastor of Thornwell Home for Children. As if that isn't enough, Alice is also a chaplain in the U.S. Air Force Reserves, and she holds the rank of captain. And it's because of that service that Alice actually recorded the sermon, well, it's been a few weeks now, because she was preparing to leave on her, I'm not sure if it's annual or semi-annual, muster. She needed to be in uniform and be present as a captain in the U.S. Air Force Reserves, and so she graciously recorded this sermon before departing to discharge her duty. Alice is also author of the book, Maximizing the Meantime, Feasting on God in Times of Famine. She has also, in the wider church, done a variety of things, chairing the Committee on Representation for the Synod of the South Atlantic, serving on the Presbyterians Caring for Chaplains and Military Personnel Board of Directors, and serving on the Board of Directors for the Presbyterian Mission Agency. Friends, we are blessed to have someone who has served at some of the highest levels with us here at Davidson College Presbyterian Church. Welcome to the Reverend Dr. Alice Rigel. Good morning, siblings in Christ. What a joy it is to worship God with you today. For this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I invite your attention to our Old Testament reading for this morning, Psalm 136, verses 1 through 3. Hear now the word of the Lord from the New Revised Standard Version. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. Our New Testament reading comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. This morning, I'd like to tag these texts with the title, God's Amazing Love. May I ask you a question? Have you ever asked a child to describe love? If so, you are keenly aware that children see love in some of the most fascinating ways imaginable. I once read an article titled, What is Love Through the Eyes of a Child? This article listed the responses of young children to the question, what does love mean? And the answers given by the children were priceless. Perhaps you've heard some of these before. Eight-year-old Rebecca said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Noel, age seven, said, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt, then he wears it every day. Then there was Tommy, age six, who said, 
Love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. Six-year-old Chrissy said, love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your french fries without making them give you any of theirs. Five-year-old Carl noted, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it, said eight-year-old Jessica. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. And then, friends, there was the budding theologian, Jenny, who said, there are two kinds of love, our love and God's love, but God makes both kinds of them. Indeed, God does make both kinds of love, divine love, human love, and even in the very songs we sing, we are reminded of God's love. Remember this one? I bet you do. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Simple yet also profound. Indeed, the Bible does tell us of God's amazing love for us. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Psalm 86, 5. From everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear God. Psalm 103, 17. Love comes from God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 7. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16. Love makes the human experience worth living, yet I declare to you today that human love with all its merits pales in comparison to the divine love of God, which is so amazing and unfathomable that it can be hard to grasp. Augustine of Hippo tried to grasp it and he said it this way. Uh, Augustine said, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. You know, the story is told of Donnie and Matthew, two adolescent boys who were exploring in the woods near their home one Saturday in early spring. As they followed the creek behind the house, they came across a scrawny black and white skunk caught in a steel trap by its front foot. The two boys figured the trap had probably been set for muskrats, but it had caught a skunk instead. Now Donnie, filled with compassion for the poor critter, decided he tried to free the skunk. But Matthew wasn't too sure he wanted to get involved. As Donnie slowly inched his way toward the skunk, Matthew kept his distance, holding his breath all the while. You're going to be sorry, Donnie, Matthew warned. But Donnie, undaunted and unbothered by Matthew's warning, kept right on walking slowly and gently towards the skunk. Donnie finally got close enough to reach forward and close his hand around the trap, which had caught the skunk's front paw just above the wrist. As Donnie grasped the trap, the skunk pulled away as far from him as the chain would allow, never taking his little black eyes off of him. Moving very slowly, Donnie gripped both sides of the trap as the helpless skunk stayed perfectly still while watching Donnie's every move. As Matthew looked on from a distance, Donnie slowly pressed down with both hands until the spring catch released. Suddenly, the skunk's leg came free and it just stood there for a moment, gathering itself and holding up its injured but unbroken leg and paw. Then after a brief while, the free skunk turned and hobbled away. A skunk is arguably the last animal anyone would want to get close to, much less help. A bubbly little puppy, now that's a different story. A cute little kitten, now that's a different story. Maybe even a squirrel, maybe. But a skunk? If you've ever smelled the offensive spray that skunks release as a defense mechanism when they're in distress, then you know why it is best to keep your distance from skunks. And if the truth be told, many people in Donnie's shoes would opt to let the trapped, helpless skunk fend for itself. After all, that was Matthew's decision. 
But rather than worry about what could happen to him if the help, helpless little skunk uh, wasn't, wasn't helped, Donnie thought about what would happen to the skunk if he didn't step in and do something to help him. So he set it free, not because he had to, but because he wanted to. Did you catch that? Donnie, Donnie set the skunk free, not because he had to. He wasn't obligated. Donnie set the skunk free because he wanted to. Friends, I shared this story not to imply that any of us are skunks because certainly we are not. Rather, I share this story because in some ways, if you will, Donnie's unselfish action towards the helpless skunk is a reminder of God's unbiased, uninfluenced, and unconditional love for us. If God wanted to, God could choose to ignore us, like Matthew, who chose to ignore the skunk for fear of being sprayed. God is not obligated to love us because God is not obligated to do anything. God is God. But God, who is rich in mercy, God, who is compassionate and gracious, God, who is slow to anger and abounding in love, God freely chooses to lavish God's love upon us despite our faults, our failures, and our flaws which underscores the awesome fact that God's amazing love is not simply a feeling or an action. God's love for us is a choice made by God out of no obligation. Paul Washer, a Christian evangelist, said this, I have given God countless reasons not to love me, but none of them has been strong enough to change him. And while we should take great care to understand God's love alongside God's justice, the good news for us is that there is nothing we can do or cannot do to alter God's love for us. God's love, said Jonathan Edwards, is the most unstoppable force in the universe. God loves us more in one moment than anyone could love us in a lifetime. But the question before us today is why? Why does the triune God, creator of the universe, love us so much? I mean, we, we know why we love God. God is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. God is Jehovah Shalom, our peace. How could we not love a God who provides for us and gives us peace? We know why we love God. We love God because as it is recorded in Psalm 46 and 1, a God is our refuge and strength, a present help in times of trouble. So we know why we love God, but why in the world does God love us. Perhaps David wondered the, the same thing, for it was David, the little shepherd boy turned king, who penned these words in Psalm 8 verse 4. What are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them? The late Eugene Peterson translates Psalm 8 and 4 this way in the Message Bible. Just hear it translated this way, please. It, it says, why, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look our way? Friends, have you ever wondered why God bothers with us? I mean, have you ever thought about it? Think about it for a moment. We are prone to fluctuations. We are human. When it comes to our walk with God, sometimes we're hot and if the truth be told, sometimes we're cold. Sometimes life throws unexpected circumstances our way that sidetrack us, shake us, and set us back. And in those times of uncertainty, if we are not careful, our faith may fluctuate. So why does God, whose love never fluctuates, why does God bother with those of us who are so easily prone to fluctuation? Why? As Peterson puts it, does God take a second look our way? Friends, the answer is so simple. It's because of God's amazing love for us. That's why God is mindful of us, because God loves us. That's simple, but so profound. Listen, in his commentary on 1 John 4 and 9, John Calvin writes, For if we were to be asked why the world has been created and why we've been placed in it to possess the dominion of the earth, why we are preserved in life to enjoy innumerable blessings, why we are endued with light and understanding, no other reason can be adduced except the gratuitous love of God of God. God could have ignored our helpless plight. Instead, God made provisions for our salvation. That's love. God could have wiped out humanity with a word. Instead, God redeemed humanity with God's son. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life. As Calvin puts it, 
God clearly showed how singularly he loved us because he exposed his only son to death for our sakes. That's love. You see, friends, love is, love is it's not what it says. Love is what it does. And in the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, perhaps one of the best known and best loved chapters in the entire Bible, we find the Apostle Paul in this letter to the believers in Rome offering strong sentiments and declarations about the amazing love of God in Christ. Considered by some to be a statement of faith, Paul asks in verse 35 of Romans chapter 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Paul knows that the original Roman recipients are suffering. And so in verse 35, he lists these seven circumstances that they are going through. Hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. And while these seven circumstances are arduous, Paul quickly asserts that not even these seven atrocities can separate us from the love of God in Christ. To prove his point and to provide comfort to the Roman believers, Paul quotes Psalm 44, 22, saying in verse 36, as it is written for your sake. We are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. Friends, this quote from Psalm 44, 22 refers to a time in Israel's history when the children of Israel were lamenting the cruel and relentless deaths of godly people at the hands of evildoers. And so by referencing Psalm 44 and 22 in Romans chapter 8, verse 36, Paul reminds his original recipients that faithful believers before them had gone through and had come through what they were presently going through. And then, then in verse 37, with great hope and great faith, Paul boldly proclaims, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Essentially, Paul says to the Roman believers, I know things are not going so good right now. And I know your faith is being tested and tried. But through it all, there is good news. And the good news is this. The love of God in Christ Jesus will enable you to overwhelmingly conquer and rise above every adversity that comes your way. In all these things, Paul says, we are more than conquerors. Paul does not say in all these things we might be or we could be more than conquerors. Paul says in all these things, we, we are more than conquerors. Did you notice? I mean, did you catch it? I bet you did. In verses 35, 36 and 37, Paul uses us in we language. Look at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 36, we face death all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. But when Paul gets to verse 38, I said, I said, when Paul gets to verse 38, he intentionally and dramatically shifts from we and us to I. Paul makes it personal in verse 38. Listen, verse 38 says, for I am convinced. The Greek construct here suggests that Paul is giving a personal testimony if you will, in, in, in an attempt to convey to the Roman believers uh, his unwavering confidence in God's love. So essentially, Paul says in verse 38, I was convinced before, but I am even more convinced now. And I know that I know that I know beyond the shadow of a doubt that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. For I am convinced, Paul says, that neither death nor life, that's no condition of existence. Neither angels nor rulers, that's no spiritual unseen being, nor things present, nor things to come. That's nothing in time, nor powers, that's spiritual rulers or earthly rulers, nor height, nor depth. That's nothing in the highest heights of the sky above or in the deepest depths of the ocean below, nor anything else in all creation, Paul says, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Watch this, our Lord. Paul was convinced, but the question why comes up again. Why was Paul, the persecutor turned preacher, so convinced? Why was Paul, the hater of the church, turned lover of the church, so certain 
that nothing could separate him and us from the love of God. You see, friends, Paul had suffered many terrible things for the sake of the gospel. Paul had been thrown in jail. Paul had been beaten with whips five times, beaten with sticks three times, shipwrecked three times. Paul had been stoned. Paul had been left for dead. But through it all, Paul remained faithful and faith-filled. And it was God's love, God's amazing love, that comforted Paul when storms raged in his life. It was God's love, God's amazing love, that anchored Paul when things unraveled in his life. It was God's love, God's amazing love, that encouraged Paul when discouragement came into his life. It was God's love, God's amazing love, that uplifted Paul when his heart was heavy. It was God's love, God's amazing love, that convinced Paul with all his innumerable flaws, faults, and failures. Paul wasn't perfect, we all know that, but it was God's amazing love that convinced Paul. Regardless of the situation, nothing could change, estrange, or rearrange God's love for him and for us. That's good news. And I ask you today, are you convinced? Are you too convinced that nothing in all creation can separate you from the amazing love of God? I believe I'm preaching to some convinced people this morning. Are there any convinced people of faith listening to this message so, so, so what do convinced believers do? Thank you for asking. I'll tell you, how, how do we as convinced believers respond to God's amazing love? We respond by loving one another, using our influence and affluence, not for ourselves, but for the glory of our God. We respond to God's amazing love by giving our time, talents, and treasure to build the kingdom of God. We respond to God's love by acting justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God, by comforting the comfortless and helping the helpless, by letting the love and light of Jesus Christ shine in us, around us, and through us for all the world to see this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine everywhere I go. I'm going to let it shine. That's how we respond to God's amazing love. And so convinced believers, I encourage you in the words of the psalmist to give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods for his steadfast love endures forever. I encourage you to give thanks to the Lord of lords for his steadfast love endures forever. The great thing to remember, said C.S. Lewis, is that though our feelings come and go, God's love for us does not. The good news for us is that we are and we always will be loved by an ever-loving God with an everlasting and amazing love. Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, Lord of love. Our hearts unfold like flowers before you, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. And so with joy, we thank you, God above, for the gift of your amazing love. Separate us now. What a 
wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ our King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful Will you join me in our affirmation of faith taken from Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. We believe in Jesus Christ, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Hello again. It's me and some of the Henry family friends, and we wanted to make sure that you knew that there's a special part of our service of worship today. At the end of the prayers of the people, when Pastor John and Pastor Claire get ready to start the Lord's Prayer, we're actually going to stop them, Whoop! and instead we've got a video and want you to open your eyes for the Lord's Prayer. A couple of our second graders took a special class to learn how to do the sign language and body language for the Lord's Prayer. We want you to have your eyes open so that you can say the Lord's Prayer as they say it and enact it for us. So appreciate that part of the prayer. And again, you can open your eyes. They'll have their eyes open when it comes to that part of the service. Will you join me in prayer? Wonderful God, God of laughter and promises, source of all joy, and source of hope, hear our prayers. In the calm of this space, we are mindful of those who do not know the beauty of friendship and community, the calm of daily bread, the peace of life without violence of war. So we lift up to those people around the world who suffer this day, the poor, the hungry, those facing rampant disease. We lift up to you those places torn apart by war and conflict and natural disaster. As if we need to lift them up to you, you are already there, compassionate and strong. Help us to follow your example and to help as we can. In the calm of this space, we are mindful 
of those in our community who are racked with worry and anxiety about the, their health, of the health of those they love, about work and finances, about their kids' well-being and their education and their social lives. We lift up to you all who are anxious about so much as if we need to lift them up to you. You are already with them, the still small voice in the midst of the storm, reminding them to breathe and to trust. In the calm of this space, we give thanks for our graduates, those who graduated from Davidson College this past Tuesday, those who graduated yesterday, and for those who will take this big step in the coming weeks. We pray for those high school seniors as they embark on the next steps of their lives, and those who are graduating from college and other degree programs, that you firmly hold them in your hands as they go on to what's next for them. In the calm of this space, we give you thanks for this time, for this time set apart to worship. We lift up to you all our praise for the good in life and the struggles that help us grow. We lift up to you that which we cannot name aloud. We lift up to you our hearts, knowing that you have had them all along. We offer our prayers in Jesus' name, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our next song comes from Africa. It's called Tumamina. We'll sing two parts, a lower and a higher. We'll start with the lower. Tumamina, 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 so mandla. Tumamina, 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 so mandla. Melody. Tumamina, 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 so mandla. Tumamina, 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 so much. Send me, Lord, send me, Jesus, send me, Jesus, send me, Jesus, send me, Lord. Lead me, Lord, lead me, Jesus, lead me, Jesus, lead me, Jesus, lead me. Fill me, Jesus, fill me, Jesus, fill me, Jesus, fill me, Lord. To Mamina, to Mamina, to Mamina, to Mamina, so my love. Friends, as we get ready to go out into God's gorgeous world, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face, the rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may the Lord hold you in the palm of his hand. And now, on the last Sunday week, we can really embrace this fully. Grab your phone. Flip open your iPad. Open up your laptop. Get ready to text, to tweet, to email to someone the peace of Christ. And for you and for those in your household, the peace of Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. You're still here? It's over. But since you're here, watch these thank you videos. See you next week.
must take a moment to thank a few people and call them out for their contributions to the 945 worship service during the pandemic. Why am I giving this thank you now? To give us an extra week of preparations before we return to in-person worship, this week's music was all from previous Sundays. We started out simply with Robert and I on the screen each week, but soon we were able to include others. Eventually, the way we did our music was 10 days before a Sunday service, Robert and I would record on Tuesday and Wednesday. And then on Thursday or Friday, I would compile the music and send it out to our volunteers. They would then listen to the music through earphones and record themselves singing or playing. Their videos were due the following Tuesday. On that Wednesday, I would put the videos together and get them to our video compiler at Suzy Films on Thursday. Peter and I would proof the service on Friday and then have it uploaded on that Friday or Saturday. So here is my long and hopefully complete list of all the musicians to, that contributed to the 945 pandemic worship. Our singers included Aaron Manzel, Grace Gardella, Julie Alexander, Maria Howell, Elizabeth Mills, Stephanie Malaszewski, and Dave Malaszewski. We also had Ann Alexander, Michelle Hauk, Lynn Cushing, NJ, Lucy, Wynn, and Mia. We also had music from Audrey, Emily, Abby, Bella Galloway, Anna Rollins, Rusty Knox, Monica Galloway, Beach Galloway, Robert Alexander, Madeline Alexander, Claire, Kyra Hurst, Kristen Hurst, Cooper, Mark, Linda Dumizo, Christina Terry, Brad Reddick, Kelly Brinson, and along with the virtual choir. Other percussionists also included Marshall Erb, Stuart Sloan, and Stephen Worley. Thank you to each one of these musicians. And while learning to do audio recording and video editing, I learned that the most difficult instrument to record is the bass. Mark Newbold and I went through several iterations of how to record the bass and finally figured it out. And I told Mark, I don't have another bass player set up to do what you do, but if you want to take a week off, just take it. He never took one. So a special thank you to Mark Newbold for being on screen every week. I skimmed through every 945 video, but I'm sure I might have still missed someone which is always the danger of doing these call out thank yous. If I missed anyone, please tell me. Thank you to all of our musicians for their help, dedication, and skill. And I'll see you on the 23rd. All right. And that's a wrap.